Well, welcome everybody. Uh, the room is filling. We're really glad that everyone's here. We wish we were doing these in person uh, and we're easing our way into uh, Cavalry Conversations in person. The next one will be sort of half in person uh, at a caveat actually, a uh, cool event space uh, in downtown Manhattan. Uh, so it's a transition, uh, but we're getting there and we're, we're very grateful to all of you for, for sticking with us. And we're especially grateful to our guests, uh, Helen Scales and Ian Urbina and to Doug Main, uh, who will be uh, moderating. Uh, I'm Dan Fagan and I'm the director of the Science, Health and Environmental Reporting Program at NYU and a, a professor of journalism at NYU. And I've been an environmental writer uh, for a long time. And one, one of the great pleasures for me as a professor is to see other people uh, really getting into the environment beat. And uh, Doug Main is certainly one of those people. Uh, Doug is a, a senior writer and editor for National Geographic. He spends a lot of time focusing on animals, uh, including wildlife. He's writes about all kinds of things, uh, including, the, including uh, uh, biota in the oceans. He freelances too. He's, his work has been in the New York Times and the Atlantic and the Washington Post and Scientific American. Uh, and before he was at National Geographic, uh, Doug was in Newsweek and before that at Popular Science and before that at LiveScience.com. Uh, and before that, he was uh, a, a student at CHIRP and, and uh, even then he was really passionate about environmental stories. And like I said, it's been just a real pleasure for me to watch his career unfold in such a, a terrific way. Uh, a couple of just housekeeping notes. We're going to use the Q and A box uh, for questions. So we really want all of you all in the audience to interact with our speakers. Uh, but we'll need to do it through the Q&A box, not the chat box. So please, you, if you click on Q&A on the bottom, that, that box will uh, pop up and uh, please use that. And Doug and I will both monitor the Q&A box and, and find a way to work those questions in. Uh, we're here to talk about the oceans and journalism, of course. Uh, and we just have the the perfect panel, all three of these folks, uh, to, to steer us through that. Uh, but we want you to be part of the conversation too. Uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Doug to formally introduce our guests and to get the conversation rolling. And meanwhile, I will turn off my video because no one wants to see me, uh, but I'll still be here and we'll, we'll pop back on uh, uh, as, as needed. Uh, so Doug, take it away. All right. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Dan. And, and thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited about this panel. We have two amazing guests with us. Um, the topic, as I'm sure you know, is about the ocean and the crises that are uh, affecting the people and wildlife uh, that live there. Um, I guess I'll just go right into introductions because I want to, I'm very excited to speak with these two. First, we have Helen Scales. She is a marine biologist, PhD. Um, she is the author of several best-selling books, the latest being The Brilliant Abyss, right here. Um, the book is about the deep sea, uh, the animals that, the animals and plants and all the other wildlife that live there, and also the threats facing it. She also contributes to a variety of publications, such as National Geographic, The Guardian, New Scientist, BBC Focus, and appears regularly on BBC Radio. She also teaches marine biology and science writing at Cambridge University. We, uh, I'm also excited to introduce Ian Urbina. He's an investigative reporter um, who's won many awards, including the Pulitzer, he ha was at the New York Times for about 15 years. I think that's right, Ian, from 2003 to 2019. Um, during five of those years, I think a total of three at sea, uh, which I'm excited to hear more about, he wrote a series of stories about crimes 
at sea called Outlaw Ocean. That series won many awards, including the George Polk Award, uh, and it became a book, which is right here, Outlaw Ocean. Um, Ian left the Times in 2019 to form the Outlaw Ocean Project, which is a nonprofit devoted to telling stories about crimes at sea. Excellent. So maybe I would like to start. Um, I my introduction is is one thing, but I would like to hear just from from your own uh, your own voice about you know how you got to where you are now in your career, and I'm also curious, uh, just kind of a brief a brief summary of how you got to where you are, and I'm wondering if there's a moment in your life or career, uh, some kind of experience that where you became fascinated with the ocean or you realized that this was something that you wanted to work on, you know, for devote your life to. Uh, let's start with Helen. Thanks, Doug. And I just want to start off by saying I, I really am just so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me um, for all of you coming along and to be speaking alongside Doug and Ian is, is a huge pleasure and an honor. So thank you so much for having me. Um, also, I should point out I'm in the UK. Um, so if at any point I start dropping off, it's not because I'm bored. It's just because it's late. <laughs> I have coffee. It should be fine. But just in case. <laughs> um, so just a word of warning there. Um, but yeah, so I guess um, I guess I could to maybe describe to you a couple of moments in my life, which I think bring me to where I am today, both in terms of um, the ocean and also writing about the ocean. Um, I, I'm, I sort of, I do, I did have this aha moment, um, scuba diving in the UK. I think I was 16 or 17 and I decided I would learn to dive. I didn't live anywhere near the ocean at that point. Well, not too far. I mean, I live on an island in England. It's, there's not too far to go, but I was in a landlocked county, but I decided uh, that I wanted to, to scuba dive for, kind of thought it would be quite fun and I took my first open water dive and it was March um it was a lake it was like a flooded gravel pit the kind of place you'd go training um I remember jumping in the water I was wearing what they call a semi dry suit um but it didn't seem to be much dry about mine it was just very wet and cold very cold um I'd spent months already training in the pool uh, in the swimming pool and this was my first time out, out of water I jumped in this ridiculously cold water started seeping into every every corner of my suit. I couldn't see beyond my hand in front of my face. And I did start to wonder what this was all about. Um, but then I, you know, I, I got down there. And my kind of my dive instructor was pretty much holding my hand, so I didn't kind of disappear in the murk. But then basically one little tiny fish, one little just it was nothing special, just a small little silver fish came into my view and hovered in front of me. And I just remember having this extraordinary feeling of the glass in the aquarium had fallen away in front of me and I was in its three dimensional world. And if my skills at diving were better at that point, they were pretty poor. It was my first time out, outdoors, but I figured I could basically I could follow after it. That's the thing I couldn't do before. You know, you're watching fish and they're swimming around, you know, in those glass boxes. But I was in this endless glass box, really. And I just had this feeling I wanted to follow it and learn more about it and basically spend as much time as I could um, underwater. It was the physical sensation combined with that kind of that particular encounter with it, this animal that I'd never seen in its own environment before. Um, so um, having been a very kind of nature, kind of green outdoorsy kind of kid, suddenly my vision went to kind of blue from maybe green and um, the oceans were, were kind of for me and I got myself in salt water and everything from there basically got better um, from that very cold encounter in that lake um, and it was sort of went there from you know went on from there um, I did a lot of studying um, in, in marine science I did a master's a PhD and, and it was actually then the second moment I want to tell you about is during my PhD which was um, I went into it with this very clear view that I was going to become a marine conservationist, a kind of academic um, who would go and save the oceans, basically. That was my, that's what I was going to do. Um, probably working for an NGO somewhere, heading up WWF. That's how I saw myself coming out of my PhD or somewhere down the line. But then basically, I just completely unexpectedly found this love and interest and I guess power in communicating and in writing and in talking about the oceans. And this was something I, ne I honestly had no clue about before I started the PhD. I, um, you know, I wrote because I had to, uh, you know, pass exams and write papers, that kind of thing. But it had never occurred to me that this would be something that A, I would enjoy, B, that I was okay at and I could get better at, and that B, C, would be this powerful tool to communicate. Um, 
And, and I was very fortunate because at that point, being kind of just a part way into my PhD program, I had a whole bunch of opportunities to try out science writing and science radio. Um, I, you know, I got trained up in a student uh, radio station and I had a go at that. Um, so I basically had a go at kind of trying these things out in a really safe environment. You know, it didn't really matter what I wrote for the student newspaper. It was just kind of trying things out. But I found I really liked it and that I could get better at it. Um, so by the time I finished my PhD, I had this idea of a slightly different path to the one I had going into it. Um, I carried along on that same route for quite a while. I worked for NGOs as I came out. Um, I did some other projects around the world, um, you know, as a scientist working in the field. But at the same time, I had this kind of writing plan going. I started freelancing kind of on the side, started writing for National Geographic website, for their news website, um, and had this idea for a book kind of ticking over. And it took a couple of years to get that first book off the ground. I was very lucky to get an agent um, not too, too long out of my PhD, and they helped me to get my first deal, which was a book about seahorses. I very clearly remember meeting an agent, and they said, so, OK, what do you want to write about? Don't write about your PhD. And I was like, okay, <laughs> not that. And I didn't do a PhD on seahorses, but I thought they were lovely creatures, so I would do that. Um, yeah, and I guess the rest kind of built up um, from there um, of me just taking a, it a book at a time, a job at a time. Eventually, I went full time, uh, more and more towards the writing and the communicating, um, managed to get myself lots of uh, more and more work at the BBC to make radio programs and documentaries with them. And so for me, I can it's really built up to me to be a sort of, I guess you'd call it portfolio career, you know, I do mix things together. I've now managed to sort of keep a foot in the science world as well as the writing and the, and the, um, the documentary world. And I really love that. I love having that mix of things to do. Um, it means that, you know, every month, every uh, year, every week, I'm doing something a bit different. Um, sometimes I'm doing too many things at once, um, but uh, I do love it. And I think this is where I, I, it wasn't where I was expecting to be. At this point, you know, it wasn't what I was thinking I was going to be doing, perhaps, you know, through my 20s. But in my 30s, it really kind of cemented that sort of path for me and it seemed to be working and it still is. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. So that's quite a long story into where I am now, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of a slightly unplanned but sort of serendipitous um, discovery of where I am now and, and, you know, who knows where it might go next. That's great. How about you, Ian? Um, so I, uh, I think actually my interest, uh, began above the waterline. Uh, I was doing doctoral work, uh, in, uh, an anthropology program, cultural anthropology, and sort of ran away from my dissertation, took some time off and, uh, went to, uh, work on a ship in Singapore that never left port. Uh, and so for three months we sat there and, uh, you know, um, as a, cultural anthropologist does, I sort of wandered around and got interested in the people and the sort of the diaspora transient tribe of seafarers that roam the globe just kind of captured my imagination. And, and so then, um, you know, after about three, four months, I went back to uh, grad school and, um, you know, ended up at the New York Times and always harbored this uh, real curiosity about that frontier and quite especially the people that work out there and, and, um, and as well, the marine life and, and sort of the experience of traversing it, but um, most especially the people. That's interesting that the first experience was with people um, with, on a ship that couldn't go to sea. It's, it's almost, um, I don't know, there's something poetic about that. So uh, I'm curious, how long did it take to uh, to get back out to, well, to actually get to sea? Um, I, I mean, can you describe how you're, the reporting obviously has been in the investigative, um, focused on a lot of, um, you know, misdeeds, scandals, etc. How did that lead you back to the ocean? And when did you first really get involved and, and have the idea for um, the Outlaw Ocean series? I mean, so I was an investigative reporter and to some degree, the mandate of that branch of journalism is, you know, as at least as I define or understand it is, um, you're really hunting for things that are broken um, to shine light on them so that they might be fixed. So, um, you know, uh, I um, had finished up a series uh, and my editor asked me what I wanted to do next and I wasn't ready for the conversation, frankly. And, and I had harbored this notion of, wouldn't it be amazing if I could get the gray lady, the New York Times to pay to send me to see 
I know for a fact, you know, from 15 years ago, you know, uh, that um, there's pretty incredible things happening out there and quite especially at the intersection of human rights, labor and environment. Um, and I was a bit frustrated with, in my view, how um, stories that come out of the space tend to focus um, exclusively on the environmental um, issue at the, um, and not as much on sort of the intersectionality of it. And so I, I thought, well, um, you know, it would be great fun. And um, I know there's really great um, stories and not a whole lot of competition. And, you know, also I won't run into the jurisdictional issues of um, parachuting into other people's beats in their backyards because uh, at the New York Times, there is not a reporter who owns that territory. So for a lot of reasons, um, it just seemed like a really good fit. Uh, and, and, you know, again, one of the goals that we had at the outset was, you know, if you say, you know, maritime crime or bad stuff that happens at sea, most people would say BP spill or plastic pollution or, you know, um, uh, you know, Somali piracy, uh, all legitimate, you know, uh, concerns, um, and overfishing to some degree. Uh, but, um, I, I wanted to look at, you know, intentional dumping of oil, not spilling of it or sea slavery or murder of stowaways or arms trafficking or illegal whaling or, you know, a myriad other things that would broaden the taxonomy of what people understood to be happening out there that might be of um, concern. That makes sense. And then, so uh, I assume it started small. And then when did you genuinely want to do this as a series? Um, was there a certain point you kind of got hooked and, and was, was there a book in mind at that, at that point or? No, so this meeting was sprung on me and I kind of, I had floated this crazy idea before and had always gotten this kind of, you know, quizzical, skeptical look from editors. Like that sounds impossibly slow and costly and maybe dangerous. Uh, uh, and this editor, um, she had been an editor at the Baltimore Sun, she's kind of a famous editor at the Times, at least named Rebecca Corbett. And she was David Simon's editor at the Baltimore Sun who you know, wrote The Wire. And she oversaw a series of The Sun about ship breaking that won a Pulitzer. So she actually already had real familiarity with the crazy stuff that happens in the maritime and, and distant water fishing fleets. So I was sort of pushing on a, a semi-open door uh, and I pitched her on the thought of, look, I, I, you know, I really know that there's really intense stuff happening out there. And I think it'd be an amazing series if you trusted me to go after it. And so she said, uh, you know, write a memo. So I wrote a ten memo with 10 proposed stories and then we took it to the Dean Baquet, the executive editor, and he whittled it down to five that really interested him. Uh, and then they said, why don't we start with these three and see how that goes. And off I went, you know, chasing these stories. So it was gonna be a three part series and we ran three stories after about four or five months of reporting. And then there was a really strong um, positive reaction to it. So Dean said, send them back out. So we did six more, uh, three more stories and a magazine piece. And then at the end of that, I thought, you know, then, you know, book publishers and other sorts um, approached me. And I also just had become captive, like Helen's describing, you know, kind of, um, uh, it's, it's an enchanting place for all its problems and its marvel and beauty. Uh, it really does capture you and um, uh, in some unhealthy ways, you know, too, at least for me, um, spending more and more time out there became harder to adjust uh, to life on land. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it, it, it captured me and I thought, yeah, I'm going to take two years off and go write a book on this. Uh, so that's what I did. Excellent. So th there, are, there are a lot of, a lot of issues facing the ocean. Um, and you mentioned some of them, Ian. Um, I guess maybe to start, because I, I, I do want to cover some of them one by one. I don't want this just to be craft because a craft talk, just because the issues are so um, fascinating and important. Um, I guess maybe to kick it back to Helen, the question is, so what are the most important issues facing the ocean? Um, and what do people need to know that they don't? Do you think that ocean... I just lost you there for a second. I don't know if that's my audio. Can you still hear me? I lost you as well, Doug. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's not just you. I'm Doug. so sorry. Can, can you hear me now? We got you. You came back. You're back. You're back. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, Where no, did you I, lose I, me? 
No, no, you'd finished your question. I think you asked, you were asking me. Um, okay. Don't know how uh, that happened. What would you like people to know that they don't know about the ocean as well, right? Right. And also what are the most important problems okay. facing? Yeah. So um, and I guess I'll stick with, um, well, with my beat, which is, um, which is life in the oceans mostly. And, and, um, and then sure. I'm sure Ian can speak to, um, well, more kind of directly to the human issues. Obviously there's a huge amount of overlap, but, um, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, the big, the biggest issues in the ocean are all interconnected in all sorts of complex ways, which I think is one reason why this is, um, a fascinating, but also challenging topic to write about. I mean, obviously there's climate change, um, and, um, and that intersects with, I mean, let's call it over exploitation as a general, um, term, but mostly that's overfishing and, um, and a lot of that is, um, forms of fishing, which is uh, causing significant physical damage um, to physical habitats, I guess, as well. So, so bottom trawling, um, trawling of deep sea mounts, that kind of thing. So you're not only um, looking at uh, the exploitation of vulnerable um, populations, but also kind of collateral damage in the process. Um, and again, that has ties into climate change. There was a paper out not too long ago talking about um, just kind of trying to get a handle on um, what might the climate impacts of, say, bottom trawling be by the disruption of um, carbon stores in the seabed? And there's various big numbers thrown around. Obviously, it's all models and um, various estimates are made, but maybe something equivalent to the aviation industry. Um, and then I guess like, there's pollution, and, and that's another sort of big overarching term. Climate change is a form of pollution. Um, we have the issue in the oceans of the fact that this is the um, the endpoint for a lot of the carbon that uh, humanity is releasing, and that in itself is having other issues aside from just rising temperatures, but also we have acidification, and uh, and how the oceans are are kind of just an enormously integral part of the ocean, the atmospheric ocean climate system is is kind of driving our climate. It's 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 absorbing carbon, releasing carbon. It's moving heat around the planet. It's this kind of key part absolutely key part of, of life on earth. Um, so I see those as the kind of the three big ones, I guess, sort of climate change slash pollution, I suppose, one or one to two of those, and then over exploitation. Um, what do people need to know? Well, I guess there's good and bad on this too. You need to know um, that the oceans have an extraordinary capacity to recover. Um, well, ocean life has an extraordinary capacity to recover and to, uh, to regenerate on its own, given a chance. Um, a lot of the solutions we have for these sorts of problems in the ocean are not rocket science. Um, we know how well, in many circumstances, um, leaving areas of the ocean alone from development and from fishing is a great way of helping the ocean heal itself, and that happens. Um, so there's that. Um, and then, I mean, there's all sorts of ways we could take this, but I guess one thing is, I, I think it's kind of important to know as well, is that there is no, there, there isn't actually anywhere away um, no, maybe that's not true. Maybe Ian's going to come back on that. But like this idea that it's beyond the horizon and we can't see it, I think that's becoming less and less true. Um, you know, how on earth do we manage fisheries? And yeah, it's a huge challenge to that. But I think it's that's one of the key things that's changing at the moment in terms of how we're dealing with the ocean is that there is a kind of hopefully a growing sense that that we have got eyes in more parts of the ocean than we ever have before. I think I'm digging myself into a hole here with you and perhaps I'll just be quiet at this point. <laughs> I agree, I agree with the, the point. I was gonna say, how would you, would you answer that question any differently, Ian, or anything you would add? I mean, obviously there's the human element, but I mean, it's, they're inextricably linked, but I just, is there anything you'd add? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Helen, everything you said, I agree with. Um, I think, um, uh, to, to sort of thread the needle between your point about um, common sense policy and the true actually existing capability of um, better protecting this space, 100% um, agree. I think um, what um, the step further I would take uh, in my direction is that there's a woeful lack of will. Uh, so it's not that we can't do it, it's, but, we, but we don't. And so I think that moves me towards um, a meta notion, which is if there was one thought that I have um, about the space is that it's distinct, it, it, there's a distinct lack of governance out there. And, and under that umbrella, you have lots of things, whether you're gonna look at you know, murder with impunity or whether you're gonna look at bottom trawling or seabed mining or 
you know, what, whatever you, you choose to look at, overfishing, um, uh, to me, they all fit under a worrisome lack of governance. And that lack might not be because they can't govern or there isn't technology that allows them to govern or that there couldn't be better policing or any policing or accountability. It's that there isn't, you know, and um, that's a, multi a bunch of reasons. The victims are typically voiceless, whether they're, you know, fish or, or you know, uh, traffic Indonesians um, or um, the, the workplace is transient. Uh, it's in a public domain that is jurisdictionally complicated. There are very few cops out there. I mean, there are a lot of reasons, but um, it can be governed. It isn't, uh, in my view. That makes sense. Um, as a place, you know, that uh, most people don't know much about or won't see much of, and if we're talking about the deep sea, you know, almost no one will ever will ever see in person. Um, I mean, a very very small amount of people will, but most people won't. Um, is it? Are there any unique challenges in writing about the ocean or communicating about the ocean because it's so remote? Like, how do you how do how do you address that that sort of challenge in your mind um, as a place that is is sort of out of sight, out of mind? Do you want? Do you want me to do you want me to start on that one? Sure, Helen. Please. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, the out of sight, out of mind thing is is just given for, I've just told you that we, we have nowhere out of sight in the ocean, but I, I absolutely, uh, Ian, you kind of nailed that point about it's a decision. It's the capability potentially is there for us to be um, seeing what's going on. We just, we just aren't, we aren't doing what these sort of fairly, fairly obvious uh, solutions we could be taking. Um, that's a whole, yeah, governance issue. Um, but yeah, the ocean is, um, we don't live there pretty much. Well, most people don't, um, Ian, you have lived there for a long time and uh, many people, um, get stuck there, but, um, or, or work there. Um, I mean, so the deep ocean is sort of the extreme version of that. And as I was setting out to write the, the brilliant abyss, I kind of had myself, um, as a writer on this topic, I was sort of, um, I felt myself kind of torn between two possibilities. Um, one, which was to do whatever I could to get myself there and, um, you know, find some way of, of getting myself a, you know, a rare seat in one of these subs that does go down and um, explores the greater depths where there's no sunlight and beyond. Um, or do what everybody else does and don't go into the deep sea because not many people get to do that, just like not many people get to go into space. And, um, and I kind of decided to go on that second route, um, partly just because I was felt like that is that is our experience of the deep ocean. It's, it's, it's the experience of most people of the entire ocean, even the edges um, and, and the surface seas are, are places that, you know, relatively well, a relatively small portion of the human population gets gets to actually, you know, do that, especially, you know, out beyond the horizon. Um, so it became for me this game of, well, how, how do we know what's down there? And um, and a lot of that is just because we have extraordinary technologies, remote technologies these days to, to look to hook up in real time, you know, uh, to these expeditions that are going out there. I did get to go on a deep sea expedition for the book specifically, but we, you know, we weren't, um, we weren't diving, we were sending remote operated vehicles. So my experience of it was on a ship. Um, and actually, I felt more restricted um, in my access to the ocean than I normally would if I was going on a shallow water expedition because I wasn't even allowed to go swimming like that was against the rules on this particular um, vessel was, you know, we were in the Gulf of Mexico, the water was beautiful and warm and blue and we just would love to have jumped in, but we weren't allowed to. It was all rope. It was just sending the machines down there. But that's the experience of, you know, the vast majority of deep sea scientists don't get to go down there. So I, you know, I wanted to experience more of of that reality of what you know how do you explore some place you don't actually get to go um but doug i mean you touched on this question of you know how do you write about a place that most people don't get to go and i think i mean in so many ways for me there are these parallels between the deep ocean and and space i mean some of them are just obvious um things like yeah people people don't get to go there but really you know we use similar technologies we send robots into space we send them down into the deep ocean that's how we know and how you know, we're sending probes we're figuring it out that way um, and yet, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I haven't done a survey of this, but I kind of get the sense that there is just something that grasps people, that they, there is just more of this excitement about space than there is about the deep ocean. And maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe if we did go and, you know, 
ask people around the world which which do you get more excited about giant squid or the possibility of giant squid um on another planet um but there is just this kind of difference between and i don't quite know how, what we do and i think that's one of the challenges is figuring out how to make you know the inner space of this planet as exciting as um the idea of heading off into into outer space um uh you know given that so much of the sort of same technologies are being used a few people get to go and come back and tell us stories about what it was like um but there just isn't quite yet i think that same feeling of excitement um and i think there should be because we are obviously finding out extraordinary things about the deep ocean more and more all the time we're not running out of extraordinary discoveries um uh and it's right here on, on earth so we should be you know i think we just I don't know if it's a branding issue. I don't know what's. I don't know what we do to to make that really kind of uh, grasp people's um, imagination as much as um, a space exploration does. Um, but we'll keep working at it, I guess. Ian, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, um, if the question is, um, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities of writing about this space. I think um, the opportunities and Helen is among the best doing it, you know, are that you get to describe another world, you know, and I personally think that um, above the waterline sort of in uh, far off in the high seas is equally, um, you know, um, fertilizing material for imagination and um, as the deep sea. Uh, so, um, for me, I think that um, uh, as a writer trying to render the experience um, of being at sea above or below the waterline, one has to think um, more of the five senses and more of really trying to, again, uh, anthropologically um, uh, render um, as if you're a radio broadcaster from Saturn, you know, like you really have to think about what Earth folk are not going to get about this space. The weather comes from above and below, you know, the light is completely different. Um, the laws of physics are different. Um, your internal biology changes if you're at sea long enough. Um, the social dynamics, dynamics on a ship are fundamentally different. The hierarchy of authority, the, the, the rules of communication, um, the consequences of, of deviation from from law, you know, like these things are really different than on land. And um, so I think really pondering all that stuff and finding a way to render it to readers that's interesting um, is a great opportunity, but it's also a huge challenge. Hey, Doug, can I add something to that? Uh, I, I, I think it's a really interesting, you know, question. Why aren't people as excited about the ocean than they are about space. And I think it has something to do with literature and, and familiarity, right? Because the oceans, you know, during the age of discovery, the so-called age of discovery, there was all kinds of literature and fiction focused on fiction and nonfiction, uh, uh, but adventuring on the oceans, at least on the ocean surface. Uh, and then once the era of space exploration began, you know, there was an explosion of science fiction about space and fiction writing uh, about the ocean really stepped back. And I don't know what can be done about that. You know, I mean, both of you all, each in your own way, have, you know, a writing, you know, truly compelling nonfiction uh, about this wild place that covers whatever, 70% of the planet or whatever it is. Uh, I guess it's more than that. Uh, but but somehow there's a kind of a familiarity to, or, or rather there's an unfamiliarity to space that oceans don't have. And I, I don't know how to capture that. I don't know whether you guys have specific sort of tips, you know, for, for sort of how to, how to make the ocean feel like what it is, which is still a, a, a vast undiscovered space it, either undiscovered or as ian has pointed out lawless uh you know and there there's tremendous potential you know drama in the lawlessness of the place uh in addition to being just truly horrible from uh, a point
point of view of human rights and biodiversity and all the things that we care about. So all the narrative elements are there, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't know, any, any, you guys have thoughts on that? Or maybe Doug does, I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, maybe don't compare the two. <laughs> like, so, like it, imagine we're talking, the four of us are reporters and we're trying to scheme on how to get our editor to um, invest in more of this reporting. First, I would say, okay, let's lose the comparison to outer space and let's compare it to on land and let's argue, hey, like we have a you know seven bureaus in Africa, but there are 50 million people that work at sea. That's more than, you know, shouldn't we um, have maybe one or five reporters uh, by ratio or, you know, two thirds of the planet, if we do it by geography and not by population, I think there are a whole lot of other ways to argue the case that this space is not just um, interesting, which I think we can do and Helen does and read her book, you know, like, um, but also like it's super, super urgent for our very survival um, from a food security, from a geopolitical point of view, from all these ways. So I think that's the angle in to convince the public or editors that we should be doubling down on this reporting. You know, Elon Musk can throw money at outer space and that's great, but like, let's just keep putting out stories about this, this place on the planet that's, like you said, two thirds of its surface. That would be my angle. <laughs> I think that's a great angle. Um, and I guess I would just add, I mean, you, you said, yeah, we've got, we've got that, um, the sort of extraordinary discoveries going on, um, in terms of the life of the ocean. And, um, and I find, I mean, I'm finding that that's, um, some of the feedback I'm getting from the brilliant abyss from the deep sea book is kind of interesting, um, from people who aren't kind of already, you know, ocean nuts, um, cause they're obviously, they're reading it, but it's, but it's like the people who weren't like, oh yeah, they were people who were kind of more sort of okay what's this about you know and and a lot of them have said to me how shocked they are um not just about the second half of the book where i talk about the problems of the ocean but in the first half and just the sort of the things that happen down there and so i guess that's kind of fun too um that it offers up just these really very different views of life on earth um your genuinely transformational views of what what life can be um and that in itself i think i think a lot of people seem to be grasping onto that which is kind of nice like i had no idea that you know there are these crazy worms that eat whale bones and um, where are they when they're not on a whale and that kind of, you know, it really gets people thinking about how life evolved and uh, what the possibilities are. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant sort of biology lesson down there. <laughs> so um, it's just all there for the taking really. I think also that, uh, I mean, a lot of this research is pretty new on the deep sea, um, especially relatively speaking. I mean, before, the 70s and 80s, uh, we didn't even know about um, that there was life, that chemosynthetic, chemosynthetic life powered by um, deep sea vents. And we, you know, we didn't really know much about that there even were deep sea vents. And we didn't know, and we're still finding creatures that live there. So I think um, coverage of the animals that we keep finding um, are, it, is just a good way to get people interested. Um, but I think, I mean, I often, <laughs> Maybe this is an aside, but I mean, I often wonder why people don't care more about life on this planet. And, you know, I mean, you're, people walk around looking at trees and they don't even know, like, I mean, this is going to sound judgmental, but, you know, like foliage blindness is a thing. Like people don't even know an oak versus a ginkgo versus uh, like an ant or a bee. And pe do people know there are like 20,000 species of bees, which is as many species of fish there are in the world. Um, so, yeah, that's something I think about and, and frankly, like try and fight against on a daily basis, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Ian, you said something I wanted to follow up on. You, you mentioned uh, it, it helps to point out the differences between things going on at sea and, and at land. That's like kind of a useful way of thinking about it. In your book, you talk about a lot of just terrible abuses um, by companies, uh, individuals, but that just would not be tolerated at land, um, or at least it, it, it's un, almost unimaginable that that it would be, uh, you know, sea slavery, um, abuse, all kinds of really grisly stuff. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, in in reporting. I mean, there's so many things to focus on, but I guess you were you were mentioning that in the context of of both illegal fishing, but also just all the human rights abuses. Uh, I think especially in the South China Sea. Um, my question is, um, 
I think part of the reason that that hasn't got more coverage is that it's uh, difficult to get out there and you're dealing with um, either illegality and abuse and things that are j just by their nature hard to cover. Can you talk about how you approach that, how you got out there and just some of the some of the challenges you faced in that uh, process? Yeah, so I mean, I think you're honing in on the sea slavery reporting. Um, so that um, specific answer differs, say, than other sure. um, uh, reporting. Um, the bulk of the book sea slavery reporting was uh, focused on the South China Sea and quite especially the Thai fleet. Um, and uh, the most um, egregious conditions tends to be on a certain subsection of most fleets, the Chinese fleet, the Taiwanese, South Korean, Thai, um, you know, uh, uh, especially um, the distant water fleet and the transshipment distant water fleet. So these are the boats that stay out at sea for very long times, don't come back to port, but they offload their catch to mother ships that bring them back to port. The, that subsection of ships sometimes will stay out for two straight years, sometimes a year, and those are were notorious. So we wanted to get, the photographer and I wanted to get on those if we could. But they're especially hard because they're so far away. And um, uh, yeah, so we how we did it, uh, we went to um, a specific place in Thailand called Songkla, which is um, a place where a lot of the distant water fleet um, was based. And a lot of the sort of most mafia kind of families that run those fleets uh, tended to be based in Songkla or Tantang. And then we sort of just, um, we thought that we might be able to find a captain willing to take us all the way out um, and talk our way onto a target vessel where we could just chronicle the conditions on one of these vessels. That was a non-starter and, you know, four or five weeks in of trying, we realized we'd have to hopscotch. Uh, so we would at best be able to find a captain who would take us 50 miles out, 100 miles out, and then talk our way onto another vessel um, on the condition that he would take us even further out, talk us onto another. And so that's ultimately what we did. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, the vessel that we we arrived to that was sort of a uh, the quintessential, um, you know, uh, sea slavery vessel um, uh, was, uh, you know, a, a what's called a forage fish or trash fish vessel. Um, this is a fish that um, was targeting fish meal um, and um, uh, fish that is not largely isn't for human consumption. Uh, 40 Cambodian crew, five Thai officers, all trafficked crew, some as young as 13. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we got lucky after a lot of trying, uh, five, six weeks of, of trying, and uh, landed a really compelling vessel to visit and spend time on in detail. When you're talking to people um, who are in desperate circumstances, either, um, you know, people in, involved in the, the people who are actually uh, kind of stuck at sea, or the or the captains and people that are that are more culpable. Um, I was really interested by something you said in the book about the the importance of silence. Um, and you know, I, I guess I mean what, one question I'm trying to ask is how do you get people to talk to you um, in, in such trying circumstances, um, especially when they are desperate and or uh, you know they don't want they wouldn't one would think they wouldn't want to talk about things that make them look bad how do you um how do you how do you get people to talk to you um i mean it obviously it varies you know um you know if we're talking to a captain that's been accused of murdering someone that you know that's one thing if we're talking to you know uh, someone that just engaged in intentional dumping of oil that's another thing but in the case of the sea slavery um well, the common denominator across all of them is number one, you have to have the luxury of time, you know, and as an, uh, that was a luxury that I was granted by the New York Times. And then I took ownership over when I became my own boss. But you really need to have the luxury of time where you can slow things down um, so that you can leverage silence and leverage sort of pacing of a relationship um, in the fishing, in the distant water fishing fleet, but fishing in general, maritime overall, seafaring, it, the bar is even higher, you know, like, um, I've done coal mining and truck driving and sex work and garments in Bangladesh and and nowhere did I find the barriers to access harder anthropologically than seafarers because there's just this sort of rough um, wall. 
So you just have to sit and spend a lot more time not asking anything, <laughs> just being present. Sometimes that will last days. Uh, um, point one, point two, I think you have to be kind of nakedly, embarrassingly honest um, about um, your interests and your preparation or your lack thereof. With preparation, I think you really do need to have done your homework. And if you're approaching, let's say, the captains on these you know, Thai vessels, uh, some of whom uh, engage unapologetically in demonstrative violence, you know, even murder, um, you really kind of have to have done your homework to um, try to wrap your head around from their view why that is important, like what, what purpose is that serving? Um, and if you go in there um, without even the least effort to try to uh, get some fluency in their, their perspective, you're probably going to get nowhere um, in terms of getting them to talk with you, um, and so that I, you know, is a hard lesson I learned um, over the years of doing this. But really, trying to almost a lot of times these folks you're talking to can't um, not because they're not smart, but just because they're not in the habit of having to explain themselves. So like you actually have to say, okay, I've talked to about five, six different captains about the use of violence on the vessels, and what I'm hearing is that. It's a scary thing to be a captain when you're four of you and there are 40 of them and you're 45 and they're 22 and you're at sea and there's a real chance of mutiny because and they will crush you. So I'm thinking that maybe the demonstrative violence, though I don't agree with it, is possibly a result of that. Obviously, you don't say it so nerdy, but like this is what you roll out a little bit slower and attempt to sort of show them that you're willing to try to to sort of get in their skin a bit, and maybe even better at it than they will be. Um, that wins you a lot of credibility in these settings. Um, uh, so, you know, waiting, silence, um, and um, kind of showing your math, showing your work, um, uh, to me, are things that help a lot. There's a, there's a scene in the book where you're talking to, um, I, I believe you pronounce his name, Wong Wong, is that how you say it? Uh, Lang Long. Lang Long, yeah. And um, I, let me, I'm just going to read a tiny bit from it because I, I was almost mesmerized by, by this. Um, you say, you write in the book, you're telling your, your translator um, what you're about to do. Um, you're warning your translator of some of my antics. I will likely sit for 15 to 20 minutes in silence at the outset after you introduce me to Long, I told him. I will want you to simply and concisely tell him who I am and what my goal is to capture the story of what happened to him. Then I will shake his hand, then we, then we will sit in silence. I'm jumping around a bit. Um, it will be awkward, I warn, but please let the quiet do its work. And then you talk about how you um, put down chewing gum and, and you drink water. But it sounds like you, you sat in silence for half an hour before talking. And um, I was just intrigued by that because I, um, I, I mean, in my, how, how did you learn, I mean, how did you learn uh, the importance of silence and, and, and that technique specifically? Did, does it have to do something specifically with um, the, just the, how the differences and the uniqueness of life at sea, or is, was it partially because this, this man was obviously traumatized and, and you were trying to win his trust? Can you just talk through that? Yeah, I mean, look, I didn't know what, I, um... I'm still learning how to do this thing and I'm 49, you know, I've been doing it for 25, 30 years. Um, and so I'm picking up things just as you and I'm sure Helen does. Um, I do think that um, my grad school work in anthropology helped a lot in, you know, I spent time in the field um, and kind of one of the earliest things I was told to do was shut up, <laughs> like just go there and sit and, and just, and don't even have a notebook out. Don't put a recorder on the table. Just shut up and sit and just watch and be present. And um, uh, that really carried over into journalism. And then, you know, like journalists, and again, Helen, you're an academic journalist, so you're of a higher species. So I, I'm not besmirching you, but journalists, we are a manipulative sort, you know, and, and we are trying to get information from people. And so you learn psych psyops, you know, psychological tactics to try to get people to relax to apply pressure. And, and the silence thing was as much respect for the trauma. This is a guy who had been shackled by the neck for a year and a half um, as he was sold boat to boat. I mean, horrific things happened to him. 
So it was sort of respect. It was also sort of meant to make him feel awkward and want to hurry up and start talking, damn it. You know, like, so that he would want to get this interview going because what are we doing here? You know, like, and um, so, uh, and sometimes that doesn't work, um, but uh, often it does. Uh, so yeah, I think I, I, I learned it um, just by trial and error. Got it. That's that's fascinating. A question for Helen. Um, as a former academic, um, well, I, I still a, a former and current academic. I didn't mean to be smirchy there. I just mean, um, you know, coming into this world from uh, from research and getting a PhD. Um, was it was it ever challenging, or has it been challenging to go from between those worlds? And I mean, how did you um, adjust to? you know, the, just the very different type of, of communication and writing that is necessary um, for, you know, for, for peer reviewed research, let's say in a journal versus um, writing a book or writing for Nat Geo or, or what have you. It's a really good question, actually. And especially now that I do a fair amount of teaching uh, of science writing, a lot of people I, 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 I speak to are, are academics who want to communicate their science better. Um, so, you know, we go through what I went through, um, although I, I kind of feel like I was pretty lucky in what I did was um, I really just taught myself. I feel like I taught myself, which is not quite true. I, I taught myself and I, I put myself in positions where um, I got others to help me kind of surreptitiously to to write better, um, you know, and I sort of just had a sort of soft launch, I guess, during the PhD days when I was doing two things, I guess. and. It, I, one of the interesting things I found was that actually, I, um, I, even just writing my thesis, like parts of that kind of was sort of already leaning towards the kind of writing I do now, like not the kind of meat and bones sort of data chapters, but the introduction and the discussion, I remember very clearly um, getting to that point. You know, I, I, you know, I, um, I had to write a great big long kind of 80, 90,000 word thesis. And, you know, I did the main sections in the middle, which was all the stuff I'd done, all the research I'd been doing and, and what I'd found out. And then I had to kind of top and tail it with this intro and discussion. And for a few days, I sat there scratching my head, not really knowing what to do. Um, and then I spoke to my, my, my advisors and they just said, ah, oh, you know, write what you want, just, you know, just set the scene and, and then, and then talk about it at the end and, you know, lean us onto whatever might happen next. And so suddenly it became this storytelling exercise, which I didn't really kind of realize was allowed at that point. And, it, you know, it wasn't full on kind of science communication because it was still for an academic audience, but I just suddenly felt, I think already I got this sense of like letting go a bit of that sort of the strict rigors of scientific, of academic writing. Um, and as I've gone along and as I tried more and more doing other types of writing, um, I have found it harder and harder to go back to the academic style of writing, which frankly appalls me at times <laughs> now that I've sort of come quite a bit further away from it. Um, and I still, I mean, a lot of it is in my daily life. I read a lot of papers. Um, I speak to a lot of scientists and there's such a wide range of the kind of writing that you get in, um, in journals. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I haven't found it. it I've just kind of taken that challenge on myself as I went along um, to the point where um, it's, you know, it's obviously something I'm going to keep working on, you know, as Ian sort of hinted, there's no end point to this or any of this. Um, we're constantly pushing to do, to do better and to do different things and to, um, to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, and that's, you know, a, a huge challenge, but also quite a joy of what we do. I think I enjoy that kind of progression of it. And it's one of the things I teach um, my students is, you know, um, the good news is if you're terrible, you, you can get better at this, you know, and I do get lots of people who find it really hard, really very hard to let go of that academic style of writing. I think I was one of the sort of people who probably wasn't ever quite suited for that way of thinking. So I was quite happy going this way, um, you know, and taking those connections between the two, but really happy to kind of go down the more storytelling route. Um, and I think as, as that story I told about my PhD was like a hint at that was like, this is the bit you're good at the end and the beginning, that middle bit. Yeah, you were fine. But I think this is where you belong. <laughs> so, so maybe that was partly what was subconsciously happening to me as I was kind of figuring stuff out post grad school was, well, actually, this is what I enjoy doing much more. I enjoy, and I, I still absolutely love telling stories. And maybe, maybe Dan, I will write a book one day, and a novel. I say, I should say, um, <laughs> and get people to love the oceans as much as space. That's I mean, a challenge I, for me to take. <laughs> I always think that the key distinction between academic writing and 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 journalism for broad audiences 
is just having a sort of empathy for your audience, you know, having a, having a keen, keen sense of, of what the audience is really looking for. Speaking of audiences, there's some good questions. I feel like maybe we should take some. Doug, is it okay with you if we do that? Uh, I don't know whether you can see them, Doug. If you can't in the q and A, I I can, I can uh, ask a few of them. Uh, sure, I can see one of them. Um, yeah. I like the, the, the second one there. Yeah, and the third one's good too, so yeah. Or, sure. Um, first, uh, yeah, so let's start with this. Um, question from Abe Musselman. Should I, are you supposed to say who asked it? Anyway, I just did. Sure. Ocean issues. Yeah, by <laughs> the way, Abe, Abe is a, sorry to interrupt, Doug, but uh, Abe is a, a current church student who came up with this idea for this event today. So thank you. Abe. Oh, nice. Uh, What's yeah. up, Abe? <laughs> um, Abe asks, ocean issues seem so global. And re when reporting about the ocean, it's easy to get lost in the big picture. Do you have any tips for journalists for starting small um, and presumably local um, and and going from there. We start with Ian. You know, there are these questions that the question answers the, itself because they're so well crafted and it leaves the answer little. I think that question answers itself. Like, I, um, I think that um, starting small, I personally think you should always try to do both. Um, and you shouldn't let yourself off with the uh, everything's local and and leave it at th that. I think you really need to try to press yourself to connect it to bigger issues uh, in some fashion. But I, but I think yeah, um, finding a local peg to it, a human peg, a geographically you know connected peg is is essential. I don't think that answers your question. Um, so sorry. Maybe Helen. Do you have any thoughts on that, Helen? Um, I think that kind of does answer the question. Um, yeah, I would say, um, well, I guess, um, like anything, it's uh, it's finding those those stories that no one else has got yet. Um, and uh, if you're lucky to, enough to live near an ocean or near a coast, then that start there. Or, or if you're traveling or you want to go someplace or there's some place you want to visit, um, you're seeking out those, those little pieces of the story that no one else has yet picked up on. Um, and as Ian quite rightly points out, it's, you know, it has that little that hook of a human story, a geographic story of something different. Um, but at the same time, I mean, so many stories about the ocean, yeah, they're global, but they start somewhere. Um, they start at a, you know, a factory sending pollution out. They start on a ship. They start with one particular story that then kind of weaves out and then maybe you come back to it at the end. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I constantly um, make the mistake of deciding I'm going to write books about ridiculously big topics and completely panic um, about it. Uh, and then realize again and again and keep kind of coming back to this idea that I, I'm, I'm not telling the entire, I can't tell the entire story of the deep ocean. That's not really the plan, but it's, it's, it's to find my way through that story, through my own smaller stories that fit together into the picture that I want to tell of this. And so much of it is it's about those sort of those interconnections of, of smaller relatable stories that that weave together. And hopefully by the end of it, you've created this kind of convincing version of this place or this issue that you want to talk about. But um, but you're never going to actually do, do the whole thing, obviously. You know, so sometimes there's this feeling that uh... You start with the local stuff and that's where the, you know, the young people, the, the early career people, the amateurs, you know, or the, you know, the young professionals do. And then you graduate to the big global stories. But actually, I don't think that's right at all. Uh, and, and that the hardest work of reporting is not from 50,000 feet. I guess that analogy doesn't work for the ocean, but uh but it's right up close. That's where the really hard work is. Uh, but Ian's point is totally right too, that, that when you're doing those really hard up close stories, uh, you have to also let readers, viewers, listeners understand what the big picture is. And there's no reason that you can't do both. You must do both. Uh, and so this sort of feeling that, you know, start small uh and then once you're really big and famous you know that 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 that's when you write the big global stories i, I think that's wrong uh and and that from the start all the way to the end of your career 
you should be telling up close stories, but also giving big picture uh, context. And, and that's what both, that's what all three, uh, you know, Doug, Helen and Ian do in their work. And it's, it's what you should do to be successful. Or just add one thing. I mean, I think um, um, thinking about first taking the word start, starting small and trying to unpack that and say, okay, by starting small, um, the aspiration should be um, small can be defined as a single incident, a single person, a single ship, a single small location, a single voyage, just start granular and located and specific. And then also know the big backdrop you want to get to and, and then build in both directions towards each other. Um, but always forcing yourself to um, figure out what's the granular and, and don't get hung up also now where I'm in the preachy tone, but you know, like um, uh, it, does, it doesn't have to be local. It doesn't mean it have to be your local. It could be someone else's local. It should just be granular and located and textured, lived. Um, if you can force whatever it is, plastic pollution. Okay, let's start with one guy and one bottle and one, you know, like some meta issue, climate change, um, but figure out what your what little location is, your synecdoche, and then, then you can head out towards your big grand arrival. You know, and we can learn from fiction, you know, from, from movies, from great novels, you know, all, all stories are, are up close, but all stories mean, you know, mean something, you know, they stand for something big. So you, we're constantly turning our, turning the aperture of our lens, making it tight, but then we're broadening it out tight, broad, you know, and that, and that's, that's what you need to do. I so think it also, just to add to that, I think it also goes the other way. I mean, in, in, in one view, all stories are local. I mean, all stories, at least they begin at, in a, up close in a, a, a particular place. But I think sometimes the big picture helps you select what, what small picture you want to start with, right? So if you want to write a, a story about some, some issue, climate change, you, you, know, you find a place where it's being particularly affected by this big picture. And there's a reason to write about this one certain place. But also, I think sometimes, at least maybe maybe this is just me and my experience. But um, sometimes I think we want stories to be bigger. Stories, if it's fascinating and it's and it's gripping and it's important, um, I think that's enough. That's enough reason, um, even if it's because uh, it's always gonna it's always gonna have bigger. There are always gonna be bigger issues at play. And sometimes I think we worry too much about um, about. The bigger picture sometimes because if the story is fascinating worth telling it's worth telling maybe i'm just uh I mean, that's just coming from like <laughs> a frustrated freelancer's point of view although i'm not i don't really freelance much anymore but uh anyway um that's great uh there's another I, question I throw in one more point about that i'll be super fast i do think as a newspaper person it's also to bear in mind that not all stories have to be magazine narrative stories like you can sure. have incredible stories look at the pandora papers you know like these are not like located one guy an anecdote you know a narrative arc they're like big reveals like what what's happening here i'm going to tell you in this amazing piece an explanation of a big question Th there's no narrative there it's just an, a, a reveal and it's amazing journalism you know so I, I think um i sometimes worry that there's a lot of pressure to make everything narrative and there are amazing stories that are not narrative they're something else and and that's okay but just having good editors and colleagues that have, can help you see which is which is, is important. For sure. Um, I can ask one more question here um, from Candace Newman. Uh, this is a question for Ian. Um, she writes, after reading your book, I wonder whether it would have been possible to investigate the stories um, as in depth as you did if you were a woman. Uh, basically, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing whether you think your stories could have been investigated by women or whether there would have been challenges around access and other issues yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. And unfortunately, I think the answer is no. I think there are huge um, liberties that as a male, especially in the seafaring realm, which is just unusually overwhelmingly male, um, that um, I was afforded by being a male. Um, and there are multiple examples in my own experience where we almost lost stories because I had a female translator and, and we were almost not allowed, you know, um, on board because there are federal laws. Like in Indonesia, um, uh, we almost were not allowed to board the ship because 
the government said this is a navy ship and they're not there are no women allowed so there are big challenges that females face this goes without saying i mean this is obvious but but um especially in journalism especially in this type of journalism and especially in journalism of this realm at the same time there are some isolated instances which i witnessed and um found fascinating where females had distinct access and capabilities and skills um, uh, in managing certain situations um, with deckhands. Uh, the female, we had a female translator with us on the sea slavery reporting. Um, and again, um, getting a bunch of these deckhands to open up, um, she was, I mean, partially just because she was super skilled and she was a translator and she had the cultural fluency and she was just a smart operator in, in handling people. She had great emotional intelligence, but also the fact that she was a female and, a, and, a attract, not to, but, and an attractive female was helpful, very helpful um, uh, to her. And very quickly became clear that Adam, the photographer and I need to pull back and get away from her and let her do her thing because these guys would talk to her and relax around her in a way. And they were interested in her in a way that they were not interested in us. Um, so there are rare exceptions, but generally speaking, no, I don't think um, and it's why, you know, some of the females that are doing, you know, this kind of reporting, including the AP women um, uh, who won a Pulitzer for the sea slavery reporting are distinctly impressive, you know, because they're um, uh, accomplishing this level of reporting in this kind of space um, being female. Doug, would you mind if I uh, ask everybody a question? Uh, sure. Uh, and, uh, while I'm at it, I just want to say we, you know, we've got oh maybe 15 more minutes, and uh, so feel free to keep those questions coming. Use the Q and A box, and uh, and we'll get to them. Uh, I guess this is maybe a, a little bit more of a question for Ian, but but I think it applies to Helen too, and that is that you have each sort of in your own way created something unique. I mean, Ian has literally done that. He, he's, he left, you know, the, the most powerful media institution in the world and just, just left and, and started a, you know, a nonprofit that's doing all kinds of interesting things that I hope he'll, he'll, he'll tell us briefly about. And Helen, you did something that academics do do, uh, but, but not many as successfully as, as you've done. And that is that you've sort of created a, a life for yourself as, as a communicator from an academic perch. And you're really, I don't know if you'd agree, but I would say you're, you're, you're really a communicator first at this point, uh, a, a, as opposed to a researcher. Although I, you know, I, I know you're still involved uh, in, in, in the science. So I guess I would love to hear from each of you, you know, here we are at a moment where you know conventional structures and revenue models of jur journalism are are not really working, uh, and uh, certainly in the book business is is also very different than, than it used to be, and it it takes a, a kind of combination of of moxie and creativity to do what you guys have each done. So maybe just talk a little bit about that. Why why did you do it and it, and how did you do it? Uh, just understanding that we don't have a, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could each talk for a really long time about that, but you know, give, give us a, 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 a concise version of, of how you pulled that off, each of you. Helen, you wanna go first maybe? Sure. Um, uh, I'll be completely honest and say early doors, uh, I could do it um, by having a, a very supportive partner. And I'm sure I'm not the only one possibly who feels slightly shameful to admit that there were early years when things weren't uh, extraordinarily um, lucrative for me. And luckily we were still living student lives and we um, pretty much, and we, we didn't need too much cash and we traveled a lot and so on, but we, you know, we, we figured it out between the two of us. But I think as an individual, I think it would have been, if I was doing that solo, it would have been much um, trickier. Um, but coming on to the sort of, yeah, um, 10, 15 years later, um, I guess I guess this comes back to, again to this what I mentioned earlier of just doing lots of different things. And for me, that's working really well. Um, you know, I teach, which is, I kind of see that almost being like the sort of um, the, the column, like the, the regular, the thing I do, um, but it fits into everything else. Um, 
there are the books, there are kids books I'm doing now and um, just other things. So I guess it's sort of having lots of, I guess in a contrast perhaps to what maybe, maybe Ian's experiences that I've, I've always, uh, well, I've never had a salary for more than six months. Um, I've been pretty much freelance pretty much since the, you know, I had short term projects, but never like, never more than about six months at a time knowing I was going to get an amount of money, a certain amount of money in my bank account. And actually that was freedom for me. Um, yes, with the supportive partner beside me, not that we've been enormously rich at any point of this, and we both of us could be earning more money doing other things. He's also an academic, but more sort of strictly down the line, he, he has a proper salaried um, uh, university job. Uh, but between us, we figured it out. Um, but yeah, we never got really comfortable with having tons of money. So we're kind of quite happy piecing that together. Not that you should get paid. I mean, you should, and this is a job that should be well paid. And getting to that point where you're actually getting paid what you should be is, is also a challenge. And then turning down possibly jobs that are, are less well paid is um, something you become more brave at, I think, the more you go along down the line. Uh, but yeah, so it's for me, it's a real mixed picture of not relying solely on one source. So when you know when one job drops out i was writing regularly for national geographic news and then that kind of dried up and i was doing other things as well so it didn't matter so i guess that resilience and that kind of inbuilt um uh yeah sort of redundancy if you like a little bit within your kind of portfolio of what you're doing is also really helpful to get you through those times when perhaps things aren't going so well in one place or another um but that's my experience of, of kind of freelance life i guess uh ian, ian uh you want to tell us a story about why you would why you would do this uh crazy thing and and uh, what tell us about the outlaw oceans project and the kinds of things that you're doing did my wife put you up to this question <laughs> like, um no i mean i uh so i was at the times for 17 years i fell sort of captive to this line of reporting there were a lot of stories that i didn't get to do for the book and there were a bunch of things that I kind of wanted to do differently with the stories um, that, at, that at the times I couldn't do. So I thought, why don't I um, create a nonprofit, step away, and why don't I try to do some of those things? So the Yellow Ocean Project is a 5013C nonprofit. It's sort of, um, to some degree, akin to ProPublica. Um, it's funded right now largely by philanthropy philanthropic dollars, but partially by some um, spin-off projects that um, monetize the journalism. Um, the things that are different were, number one, let's keep producing kind of tier one polished um, narrative that we would take and get run in the Washington Post or Nat Geo or the New Yorker, um, but let's fund it ourselves and therefore maintain control over the intellectual property. So not sell it give it, much like ProPublic does. Um, we then take the piece, that means I decide the stories and I don't take commission. Um, and um, I don't have to answer to editors calling up and saying, go do this story. So that was one thing I wanted to get away from. The other thing was, um, we then take the story to the venue, we allow them to run it for X amount of time, a week exclusively, whatever. We then, um, stage two is take, the same, take that piece, 5,000, 10,000 word piece, and translate it into 10 languages. And then we've built a, a grid of about 50, 55 different partners from big, you know, Der Spiegel, BBC, down to the Taiwan Daily News and Gunjur Online in Gambia. Um, and we um, then take the piece to them. And again, it's free and translated, and it always has the video and stills. And there's a politics in that, you know, like to try to get. Um, readership outside of the echo chamber that is readers of the New Yorker or the New York Times. Um, so stage two is disseminated. That gets a huge, much bigger audience than anything I was ever writing at the New York Times. And then stage three is translate the journalism into something else, sort of give birth to a duck-billed platypus. So, you know, the take, we take the, the reporting and we convert it into music, podcasts, animation series for Instagram, um, a mural project, you know, usually sort of hybriding it with art in some fashion. And the goal there is A, to give it longer life and B, to, to sort of target, you know, the demographic of readers like my 17 year old son who won't read the New York Times and the New Yorker, but he consumes a lot of information. And so sort of accessing him, but globally through alternate platforms. And the music project's one example where we took the sounds of reporting, we team up with musicians, hip hop, classical, electronic, 
we have them create an album, they hand it back to us, we then publish it with video, et cetera, and we put it on you know, 50 to 100 platforms, Spotify, Pandora, and the IP traffic is incredible. You know, We have 90 million listeners annually of the music, and a good 20% of those click over from the music to the story. And those are all people that probably wouldn't have read it in Der Spiegel or The New Yorker. And so, and they're all over. And so we do that with music or other things. We have a, a global mural project and other things. And that's sort of the most fun, frankly, because it's, it, it, it's just wild and weird. And the, and the financial component is the streaming revenue that comes from music from the, from the stories goes into the nonprofit. So we don't make any, we don't make profit off of it, but we do make money off of it. It comes in and funds more stories. So a story that's coming out next month in the New Yorker costs $130,000 to produce. They'll pay, you know, they're like, look, we insist on paying. So it's like, okay, great. If you want to pay, we'll take your money, but you will not own the IP. They put up 10,000 bucks for the story. Again, you'll never close that gap um, except, and, and philanthropy dollars are not sustainable, but the trickling revenue of, of the, of the music helps close that gap and, and allow us to produce the next story. So um, that's sort of one of the things that um, is um, fun and, and different in how we handle the journalism. Wow, that, that is completely fascinating. Uh, I can uh, anticipate two uh, questions from this group uh, listening now. Number one is, can they uh, be contributors? Like who, whose work is, is it, are these all stories by you, Ian, or, or are you interested in collaborators, freelancers, number one? Uh, and number two is, do you think other people can do this? Uh, mm. You know, for, for following their own, their own passions, is it possible or practical or, or do you think that this is just kind of a one-off? So on A, um, uh, we have a staff of 10 and um, right now, uh, Joe Sexton, who you know, Dan um, is on staff and, and he and I largely produce the stories. We are aiming to create now All Ocean Institute where we'll bring in you know, five to six fellows a year and sort of work with them. We're probably aiming on um, young, sort of early career journalists that are outside the US, but we'll probably have one slot for a US a year. In terms of steady, I didn't want to be an editor at the times and I don't want to be one now. And so I don't tend to, we don't tend to take outside stuff. We, we produce it all internally. We do have a couple of writers on staff and they produce um, pieces, um, but they do 25 other things because they're salaried. So right now we're not taking um, uh, unsolicited uh, content uh, in that way, um, uh, but we might start partnering in a year or so when we have the bigger capacity. Um, scalable. I mean, I think that um, I do think journalists uh, um, really can and should start thinking more daringly about collaborations with other types of storytellers. And if you think of a muralist or a musician as a storyteller using a different language or a photographer or what have you, and sort of um, working with them. Um, uh, I, I just think for, our, for both of our survival, it's something that um, really is scalable. Whether the music project per se is something that can be replicated, possibly, you know, for certain stories and certain venues and, um, uh, but um, other sorts of melding of journalism with other things for the sake of journalism getting bigger audience and more sustainable and also for the sake of, of um, creating a different type of impact on people. The music, you know, it, I, I, we often say, it, you know, these stories through music are going through the ear and down to the heart. When I write, it's words that go through the eyes and up to the head. You know, they're affecting people in very different ways. Um, and um, so I, I just think that that part of collaboration is definitely replicatable. Yeah, oh, that is amazing. Uh, so Doug, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I, I don't wanna, uh, I, I, the, 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 the ball's in your court, <laughs> however you want to use these last 10 minutes. <laughs> Great. There is one thing I wanted, well, there are a couple more things, but I'll, I'll limit it. One question um, that we that came up in, in emailing um, with Ian and Helen, um, uh, it was actually a, a question that, that Helen posed, but uh, so there are a lot of crises on the ocean. Um, one can become depressed reading about it. Um, I guess that I am curious, 
um, how important is it to be <laughs> to have some positivity in the stories? Uh, as as Helen put it, how do you write stories that are honest yet hopeful? Um, and are, are, do people just want to read like uh, stories that are you know about about problems and and things that are kind of interesting and gripping, um, or is there a place for for more sort of hopeful upbeat stuff or is that or is there something dishonest about that I, this is a this is a question that's not just unique to the ocean but perhaps is more acute in this case um uh maybe helen how, how do you what do you think about that i mean i asked that question because i also want to hear what everyone else thinks about it because <laughs> sure. it's something i struggle with and i think about a lot um i don't have a definitive answer to it i feel my way through it um day by day, week by week, year by year, I go through phases. I think when I first started hearing people talking about things like ocean optimism, I kind of, I think my initial reaction to that was slightly skeptical um, that maybe it would be possibly bordering on, not, I think dishonesty is not the right word, but just, you know, not quite accurately portraying the issues. Um, but at the same time, grappling with the idea of perhaps, you know, um, exhausted audiences, not wanting to hear about yet one more problem. Um, so I don't know. I still don't. I think I am still, to be honest, I think I am still feeling my way with that. Um, I guess at the heart of it, perhaps what I touched on earlier, which is that, you know, it's not all it's not black and white. It's not all good and it's not all bad. Um, there's a whole mixture of things going out there and um, and how I feel about those issues depends on the day in which way the wind is blowing and what I've just recently read or whatever it might be. Um, so, you know, I think there is definitely space for showing, I guess, again touching back on this idea of the resilience of the ocean the recoverability of the ocean that things can change and for the good and that good things are happening um i mean we did a podcast um about uh the sea spiracy documentary and a lot of people were kind of concerned that that particular piece of storytelling was leaving out a big part of the story about the picture of sustainable fishing being something that's being done by many different people in different ways and sure there are some problems with big label eco labeling and that kind of stuff but um it was sort of it was ignoring that um detail of an awful lot of interesting and really inspiring people doing extraordinary things to try and make things better in the ocean um so you know i don't think i've yeah i haven't answered this question for myself very well but i guess i guess maybe the honesty i can bring to it is that i'm still feeling my way on it um and it's story by story for me i mean i often work from the kind of position of that sense of wonderment um in the ocean i mean you'll if you have a look at the brilliant abyss you'll see basically it's like first half wonderment second half everything's terrible final chapter here's what we do about it so it's not rocket science <laughs> Um, but hopefully it's working to some extent to sort of balance that out, but maybe in a slightly, slightly chunkier way than you would, you know, get if you were just writing an article. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on that, to be honest, Doug, you as well. I mean, this is your beat too, right? I mean, how do we, how do we do this? Um, I think it's something that's going to become increasingly important, um, you know, as the years go by to come back to me, um, in the middle of November after we've had the COP meeting and see how I'm feeling then. I mean, may, may, I may decide everything is bad after all. I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Ian. Um, you know, I, I vacillate, honestly. Um, if I, if um, on the one hand, um, I'm strongly of the view that um, the very problems that I try to focus on are not ones that I'm seeing overly focused on. <laughs> They're usually like woefully undercovered. Um, and it's a lack of attention, a lack of sense of urgency. Um, a lack of a, a concern by the relevant parties that I see as the bigger worry I have. Um, on the other hand, I think um, Helen and you make a really accurate point that th there is exhaustion and a morale concern among the public writ large, especially post pandemic, post apocalyptic, you know, American crisis, post so many things that you do wonder whether you're worsening that problem while you're tackling another problem. Um, so at the end of the day, I still, when I step back and look at generally the coverage that's out there of this space, I see um, more, more sort of more awe than awful, you know, in, in that geo sort of terms. Like I see a lot of awe and um, uh, reporting, which I think is really good. Um, uh, 
I, I don't see as much um, uh, investigative uh, kind of reporting on um, categories of concern out there. Um, uh, so when I look at that space specifically, um, I feel like it's, it's still in dire need of more explanatory investigative reveal of issues. The one thing I would say that maybe is a uh, middle ground between both responsibilities is the notion that if you're going to do good journalism, and, and I don't think that Seaspiracy is good journalism, um, I don't think that that does this well. If you're going to do really good journalism about serious problems, then in the very revealing of them, you need to have a sense of nuance and an explanatory element that shows a path for solving it. You can't just like splash the problem and have no attempt or responsibility for showing some sort. I don't think personally um, journalists should necessarily have a, here's what you should do, a, a buyer's guide for fixing this. I'm not of that belief, but I think like in how you explain problems, you probably should try to think about what might be the fixes. And then you leave it to the advocates or the academics or the policymakers or the lawyers or who have you to then say, okay, we're going to act on this journalism and do something about it. I feel like that is very, very important for investigative journalists. But, um, but I think there's, uh, I still personally believe there's a real lack of prosecutorial, investigative, responsible, good reporting of dark stuff happening out there. Just, just one follow-up that just be while we still have time, Ian, uh, you've done a lot of things. I mean, you have a passion for investigative journalism. Um, there, you've been in a lot of places in the ocean specifically um, or reporting on piracy in Somalia um, where you, it genuinely seems like you were at risk of serious injury or death. And I, I, I wonder if you, I mean, what is it that motivates you to keep going and, and, um, <laughs> In, in experiencing things like that, do you ever, have you ever, has a thought occurred that like, this is just too risky, I need to stop or, or, or whatever? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, I don't have a good answer. I mean, I, I, my, my answer, if I'm really honest is, you know, Catholic guilt. <laughs> I know like, like yeah, I'm, not, I'm a fallen away Catholic, I'm an atheist, but, but like, I think, True. If you really, if I really assessed myself, I'd say like, what keeps me going is, is the more I'm exposed, the more I feel obligated to do something about it in my small way, which is journalism. And to walk away from it is a disservice to the very things I've witnessed. And I can't imagine doing so. So I feel a bit trapped by um, the sense of duty to try to do um, right by the problems um, that I'm witnessing. And the one way I can do that, sometimes I wonder, is it enough? Should I jump ship from journalism and, and jump full into something else? Yeah, you know, I'm haunted by that question, but, but um, I never consider leaving it. Um, it doesn't, because truth, honestly, I think I would be more haunted. The prospect of the, um, the, the sense that I know this stuff is happening and I'm not doing a whole lot about it, it scares me more than the people on these boats, frankly. So I think that's really why I keep going. Well, that's a wonderfully uh, in, inspirational uh, way to end, I think, that, that uh, you know, this is hard work, whether you're doing explanatory work or investigative work, it is hard to write about these issues because they, they're bleak in many ways. And it's our responsibility, our first responsibility is to depict reality as closely as we can. That's what we do. And, and, and that's hard. Uh, you know, the other, other day, I was hanging out with some of my friends here in the suburbs. And one of them was talking about National Geographic and saying, you know, I used to really love National Geographic, but now there are all these stories about how everything's falling apart. And I'm like, yes, because that's why, because a lot of things are falling apart. Uh, and uh, in the end, uh, even, even when it's hard uh, and even when it's, uh, 
uncomfortable for us personally and uncomfortable for the people who read us, that's what that's we we have that obligation. Uh, but it's always smart to blend it with other kinds of stories too, both for our own mental health and and for our readers too, because the world has happy news in it too, uh, and and it's important to give to give people that. Uh, very grateful to all of you guys. Very very grateful to Helen and Ian and to our uh, audience who stuck with us. Uh, and to Doug, especially for uh, organizing this and asking such good questions. Uh, this will be available online uh, in a few days at journalism.nyu.edu forward slash KC. And follow that same space because we will have additional events coming up, uh, uh, both, uh, uh, both sad and happy because that's the way our world is. Uh, so thank you all very much, uh, and we'll we'll see you uh, online uh, next time. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you so.